they'll have to spend some more. You know, it, it, if things... well, they spent they spent yesterday, and we should talk about it. The, yeah. Nico, the Nico Horner deal, right? It's uh, that's not a big spend, and everyone's like, I get why it works for both sides. Um, I feel like Horner <laughs> has to be the kind of guy that wants to limit distractions. If I had to do the psychological read on Nico Horner, super thoughtful, super smart, super grindy, loves baseball, very hardworking dude. Team first. Was always like, yeah, I'll switch positions to a less glamorous, less paid position Mm -hmm. if we bring in a premium shortstop because it'll help the team win. My guess is he's the type of guy that doesn't want to go through arbitration. That doesn't want to be asked the questions. That just says, cool, you're going to pay me $15, $20 million a year to play baseball. Mm. And I still get to be a free agent when I'm 29 years old to sign the huge contract. I'll give you one year of free agency. You give me three years of cost certainty. Let's do a deal. I think that's fair. That was looked at as a big reason behind a lot of the Atlanta deals the way that they've gone about, the Braves have gone about signing all their young guys and and buying up their arbitration years and stuff like that, just freeing them up to just go out and play. And so Nico being mentally freed up to go out and play is nice. Um, So I I see that advantage for him. The fact that it's just buying out one year of free agency means he will probably be a very healthy and productive 29-year-old with a chance to hit the market and max out the big deal right then if he wants to or sign a three-year deal and bite at it again after that. Uh, but, I mean, probably he'll get at least that one chance at age 29 to to max out and get a five-, six-year deal if he is indeed showing that he's worth it. Yeah, at that point. He, he didn't give it up. He didn't take away his entire prime. It wasn't no. anything crazy like that. Mm-hmm. But it... it my guess is there are some types of personalities, like Ian Happ. Ian Happ strikes me as a guy who he's into golf and coffee and collecting watches and high-end wine and being a players union rep, like and hosting a podcast. Like Ian Happ strikes me as the type of guy that is going to want to hit free agency as soon as possible because he knows that that will maximize his dollars Mm -hmm. and he can compartmentalize it and handle it. And there's no judgment in, in either direction, but I think that's what it would worked out great for the Cubs and Horner is because he was like, sure, you're making me a, you're making me a fair offer and it removes some uncertainty from my life. And I can just go play, go play baseball and make a killer living. I love thinking about it from the psychological profile of these guys and what actually will make them happy and make them productive. So it's, it's, it's interesting. There's also like positional value. Hap as a left fielder, um, and even though he's a switch hitter, um, but still like outfielders, man, just like, you know, replacement level outfielders or slightly above average outfielders. I, I don't know that that Ian Hap is going to break the bank in some of the ways that he has envisioned. It can be very, very difficult to uh, to to get that done when you're an outfielder with above average skills but not elite skills whereas if nico shows the ability to play shortstop and second base um and hit for a lot more contact with just a little bit of pop as the game is evolving i i think nico might end up being more valuable than ian happ over the short and maybe even long haul i think he would too but i just think it's probably a generally held belief that the younger you hit free agency the more money you will make hmm. Right? Like, obviously, if Ian Happ has a bad year this year, he will hurt his value. But as a confident guy who believes he's had it figured out and had to deal with the demotion and yeah. then settles into a position, because he's played multiple positions in the big league. He's played infield. He's played outfield. Now he's settled in at, at left field, and he was an all-star, and he was a gold glover. Like, I don't know. My, my guess is he doesn't think he's going to have a worse year this year than mm-hmm. he did last year. And if you put together a couple of all-star seasons and a couple of gold glove seasons and you're a switch hitter and all of that, he will assu- he'll you'll get paid more at 29 than you would at 30 or 30 at 31, you know? So yeah. I, I would think that, and again, we're, we're just guessing. He's not tipping his hand 
in any direction here. But the other the other side of the coin has been the White Sox signed all of the guys early, and then some people said, "Well, is there not the carrot out there anymore?" Yeah, well, right. And and the Cubs didn't sign any of their guys early, and we spent five years waiting for them to do that and watching it slowly disintegrate to the point that they had to trade them all and didn't sign a single one of them. Right. But, and Jed said that he thought that the more conversations that happened around a team in a clubhouse about contracts in the business of baseball uh-huh. was a bad thing. So it depends on the makeup. In terms of in terms of if you pay somebody whether whether they're still playing with that carrot there. What's interesting in the timeline is that Nico's contract it splits the difference between the White Sox paying all those guys a lot of them before they'd played a big league game. Eloy and Luis Robert were yeah. paid in spring training of their respective years. Um, so you know paying them before they've even really gotten there and locking them in. And then the Cubs never pay in any of them. This is kind of right down the middle. Nico's had a good long taste of big league life and knows what he needs out of it. And still will have that free agency at the end. So this Nico one is pretty damn unique in terms of uh, in terms of it it's not really a comp to those White Sox extensions or the lack of Cubs extensions. It's kind of splitting it right down the middle in its own unique way. Yeah. And I'm surprised it doesn't happen a little bit more than it than it does because it feels like both teams get something, both sides get something out of it. But I think players in baseball have been kind of conditioned to hit free agency as early as possible yeah. to maximize your window. There was a uh, there's a different free agent contract. Andre Jimenez of of Cleveland just signed one that buys out his three years of his free agency and the whole rest of his arbitration for more than $100 million. And it's a very different kind of extension than Nico. Those are the ones that are much more common. Buy out the RB years and the first several years of free agency. Nico just one year of free agency.